Hey folks, so today I'll be starting a new series all about chess calculation. Uh, it's a pretty uh, ambitious topic and it's a pretty deep topic, but I, I hope to do it justice. Um, calculation is basically the, the main skill that chess players of pretty much all levels uh, have to work on. It's what allows you to find good moves during a chess game, make good decisions, uh, and so on. Uh, of course, there are a lot of other aspects to chess as well. Calculation uh, isn't everything, but uh, it's pretty inarguable that it's one of the most important things uh, to work on. Um, while I'm talking and introducing the, the series, I, I put up a nice little problem here. It's white to play and win. This comes from one of my favorite composers, uh, Alexei Trotsky, so it's a really good one. I should warn you, it's a tough problem. I, I would say the level is around, let's say, 2000 or so, so it won't be easy, but I'll give you some time to work on it. Obviously, you can pause the video and uh, go over the solution uh, at the end. So there are a lot of different ways to work on calculation uh, depending on your level and uh, there are a lot of very effective ways. Uh, the easiest is to just solve problems and, and play a lot of games. Um, but I do feel like there are a lot of different components to calculation and the main point in this video is to try to break some of them down, uh, explain a little bit of detail and, and try to uh, understand a little, a little bit about uh, what it takes to improve the, the various aspects of uh, calculation. Uh, so to outline the topics real quick, I, I think calculation consists of um, basically five things. Number one, you have your analytical skill. This is what most chess players think of as someone's uh, real chess strength, their ability to, to find good moves, I mean their analysis skill. Uh, so this is feels like the bulk of calculation, but I feel like there's actually a lot more to it. Um, but that's number one. Number two, you have your visualization, which is your physical capability of actually envisioning uh, moves into the future, being played on the board, and, and being able to see uh, several moves uh, ahead. Visualization is something that, that all players uh, should work on, and okay, something we'll get into a little bit later. Number three, I think evaluation plays uh, an important role. Um, if you're not able to evaluate a position, assess what's important, who's better, how much, and why, uh, then your calculation really won't do you much good. You can see a position that you're going to reach three or four moves down the line, um, but if you're not able to evaluate it correctly, well, then you might be walking into a position that's actually just not good for you. So evaluation, I think, is a very fundamental aspect uh, of the calculation process. Uh, number four, you have something that I would refer to uh, as wisdom. I think there are a lot of different ways to, to describe it. But basically, it's the idea of uh, being able to understand not only um, what to calculate, but how to calculate and when to calculate. When is it the right time to calculate or when is it the right time to use some, some other thinking method? Um, as well as understanding which moves in the position are worth exploring and which moves are, are worth uh, leaving to, to the side. Um, I think um, one's intuition a lot of times uh, plays into this. Uh, and I think this is also a very, very important part of the entire process and something that's mainly developed uh, with experience. But of course, we'll get into it. And lastly, I think uh, maybe one of the most important uh, parts of calculation uh, is time management. Uh, I'm assuming most people watching this are either tournament chess players that play with a clock or online chess players that play you know rapid blitz and bullet uh, where the clock is always a huge factor in the game and because we don't have unlimited time we're not able to just calculate everything out and, and how you use your time and conserve your time and um, the speed of your calculation all of these things I think really uh, play a huge factor uh, into uh, into the process so now let's get into each one of these topics and break it down a little bit further so number one, you have your analytical skill, which like I mentioned is your ability to find good moves over the, the chessboard, uh, both for yourself and for uh, your opponent. Um, so there are many different ways to improve this part of the game. You can solve problems, you can play chess, you can analyze uh, games with uh, stronger players, you can read annotated games and books. Um, and the good news is as you spend more and more time uh, into chess, you will naturally improve this part of your game as you're exposed to more and more ideas and you really enhance your, your arsenal. Um, I would break this aspect down into, into three components. Uh, number one, you have your ability to search for, for moves or we can say search for candidate moves. Um, candidate moves is this uh, well-known 
idea of being able to find the, the key moves in a position, especially when you're looking for uh, some kind of forced mate or forced tactical win. Um, so the ability to find important moves in the positions, of course, uh, a huge, huge part of the game. Um, number two, you have your pattern recognition. So the more puzzles you solve, the more games you play through, the more ideas you pick up, the more patterns you can store, uh, I think the better. During the game, chess players are often relying on their uh, memory of patterns. A lot of times this is happening subconsciously or even unconsciously. Um, but basically the idea is the more patterns you can pick up, the more patterns you'll recognize during the game and you might be able to use uh, to your advantage. Um, there are many, many different patterns in chess. I, I don't think there are any reasonable estimates, uh, you know, something like thousands and thousands. Um, I mean, it's a very, very deep game and it often feels like the number of ideas you can uncover is endless. But the more puzzles you do, the more you play, the more chess you look at, uh, the more patterns you will pick up. And over time, again, this is something that I think uh, naturally improves. And I think the third component of analytical skill uh, uh, is one that's uh, also very, very important, uh, and that's just strictly speed. How quickly your brain is able to calculate different moves, find different moves, uh, cycle through different moves, check different ideas. Uh, speed is something that's really important. I think this is where uh, maybe natural talent starts to play a, a bigger ro role, but uh, in general, when someone is working on their chess for quite some time, their speed uh, should improve over time. So regardless of where you are now, um, there I feel like there's always room uh, to get better as long as you simply uh, keep practicing. Um, there are definitely specific exercises you can do to improve your, your speed. You can solve uh, simple problems or you can do a lot of simple problems in you know as quick a time as possible. Um, but again, this is something that I think just improves with, with natural practice. So these three components, in my opinion, is what kind of uh, comprises the analytical skill. And uh, I'll be doing a, a future video and going into a lot more detail into how to actually improve this part of your game, how to um, train and, and seek new patterns, how to improve your ability to find unusual resources, how to improve your speed, uh, and so on. So the next component of calculation that I feel is really important is uh, visualization. So like I mentioned, this is your physical capability to actually visualize or envision moves that are going to happen on the board. Uh, and being able to accurately see the board with those moves being played, uh, one, two, three, four, etc. moves uh, down the line. Um, visualization is a skill that basically all players uh, need to work on, uh, especially I would say beginner and intermediate players uh, trying to get to a higher level. Visualization is just one of the most important skills um, to, to work on. Um, but the good news is, is that in my experience, visualization uh, has very much always uh, functioned uh, similar to, to like a muscle. Uh, if you work on it and train it consistently, it will undoubtedly improve. Uh, if you neglect your visualization and you don't look at a chessboard, you don't calculate or visualize anything for a while, uh, it will definitely atrophy and your visualization skills will uh, decrease. Um, so the good news is that things are very straightforward. If you work on your visualization consistently, uh, it definitely will improve over time. Uh, the tricky thing is just being able to consistently work on it and always trying to push yourself to, to visualize um, further. Uh, so I'll be doing another video going into uh, more detail on visualization and offering specific exercises uh, and things I would suggest doing. Um, it's actually very simple to work on visualization. You just have to visualize moves and uh, try to see the position a little bit clearer and, and try to see a little bit further. Uh, you can do this by uh, solving problems, playing games where you're obviously visualizing, or even just setting up a position from, from any book or lesson, uh, and then just trying to visualize the next few moves uh, in the game. Um, for now, I would suggest if you really want to work on your visualization, I would incorporate it immediately, uh, at least 30 minutes a day, uh, every day that you work on chess. You can work on it maybe four weeks at a time and then maybe take a one week break. But basically 30 minutes a day where the focus is to try to improve your visualization. Um, advanced players can can try blindfold chess, which uh, I think is one of the, the best ways of improving your visualization. Uh, that's one of the main things uh, I was doing um, when I was around 18, 1900 or so and, and trying to uh, improve. Um, and for lower rate of players who are not yet ready to try blindfold chess, uh, you can resort to some of the other techniques that, that I just mentioned. But uh, like I said, I will be doing a more detailed video going into a lot more depth as to how to actually work and, and maximize your visualization uh, as much as you can. 
The next component I'd like to talk about is evaluation. And for this section, I've put up a problem here. It's uh, white to play. So try to find the, uh, the strongest continuation. Uh, evaluation is important not just for calculation, but for pretty much uh, all aspects of chess. Um, being able to correctly assess a position and figure out what's going on and what are the most important factors and uh, trying to understand who's better in the position and, and how much and why. Um, I, I think it's a very difficult uh, topic and there's a lot that can be worked on here. It's something that can pretty much be worked on uh, indefinitely. I, I don't think anyone in the world has an ability to just perfectly evaluate every single uh, position. Um, but there are many, many different factors in terms of evaluation that, that can be thought about and, and understood. And I think um, the more one analyzes games and uh, learns from lessons, video lessons, um, playing, analyzing their own games, uh, the more they can improve their own ability to uh, evaluate a specific uh, position. Um, I'll be going into more detail in a future video about um, how to evaluate positions specifically and my philosophy for evaluation as well as for the material for, for how to improve. Um, but for now, I think this is a pretty interesting uh, problem to, to consider. Okay, so if you'd like more time, I would definitely encourage you to, to pause the video and, and, and try to figure it out. Uh, at first glance, it feels like it's some kind of very equalish rook end game, three pawns each. But I promise you, there is a very concrete solution here, uh, and there is uh, an absolute best way for white to to play the position uh, and, in fact, win the game. Uh, okay, so here it turns out that basically, like I mentioned, things are approximately equal except for one dynamic factor, and that's the fact that Black's rook. Uh, is currently somewhat stuck on uh, h5 where it's not really doing a whole lot but it does have a way to get out via the the g5 square however if white plays the move f4 which doesn't look like anything special it's not really attacking anything it's not much of a tactical move um, but if white does make this move it turns out that black's rook on h5 is now really stuck and in fact trapped simply can't get out it can't get out via g5 it can't get out via any of the squares on the h file and it's basically just trapped on uh, this square here um, well why is that important well okay black still has to make a move and white doesn't have a clear way to actually win the rook we can't play king g4 and just take it but we do have a potential pass pawn on the queen side meaning in the future white can just play c4 here and after black takes on c4, white will be able to push the b-pawn through. And in fact, it turns out that black's king is also uh, stuck, as white's rook is cutting the king along the e-file. So neither of black's pieces are able to defend against white uh, pushing this pawn forward. Black can make a move like king f7, white will play c4, and uh, the game is basically over. Just to play out the line, after b takes c4, white can push. Let's say black also pushes because what else? Their other pieces don't have uh, any good moves. Well, eventually white's pawn will be able to reach the seventh rank. Uh, black can promote first. White will take the queen. And black's pieces are still not in time to stop white's pawn uh, from promoting and, and the game is, is over. Uh, so I really like this problem. It's uh, very... Uh, simple to understand once you you see the idea but still difficult to solve if you don't actually know what you're looking for this is of course one of the most difficult things about chess is during a game you never have someone telling you that you know you have something to ta uh, tactic something to find um some kind of solution in the position some defense you're basically given no hints and it's up to you to to do the the best you can um so well, with this problem, it would be very difficult to figure this out using only, uh, let's say, direct calculation. Because if you just start considering all of the most forcing moves in the position, uh, you're not really going to come up with a, ho a whole lot. Maybe c4 you might consider, but, well, black's rook will give a check to get out, then take on c4, and, and black will, will be fine. Um, instead, an experienced chess player can, can recognize uh, different factors about the position, and uh, once you recognize that the rook on h5 is short on squares, and after f4 that it's basically trapped, um, you can use your kind of strategic and conceptual understanding of the game to understand that, well, now your pass pawn on the queen side is basically unstoppable and it's going to win. So once again, this doesn't really have a lot to do with, let's say, uh, pattern recognition or seeing uh, tactics and combinations. Rather, this is just understanding how the pieces move around the board and, and 
what uh, a bad piece looks like, what a mobile piece looks like, things that are part of more, let's say, strategic evaluation. But it all plays a role and it all really helps with uh, the calculation. Moving on to wisdom, uh, we have a position that's uh, black to play. So if you want to try to solve it uh, without any hints, I'd recommend to either uh, think while I'm talking or just pause the video. Uh, so wisdom in, in terms of chess calculation, I think it's very important. Like I mentioned up top, um, this is what helps you figure out not only when to calculate, but what type of moves to look for when you're calculating, uh, how to anticipate your opponent's moves, uh, and, and things like that. Again, I think this can all be expanded upon in a much more detailed video that I plan on doing in the future. Um, but hopefully the, the general idea here is um, pretty straightforward. Uh, in fact, I, I think wisdom can be used to, to solve the problem in front of us uh, in, in a very uh, efficient and, and, and nice way. Uh, I don't think it's, it's too difficult. I imagine stronger players can probably figure it out uh, very, very quickly, definitely in, in under a minute. Um, for lower rated players, I would imagine it takes uh, more time, but um, I can argue that maybe that's because of not enough experience in, in solving these types of uh, situations. So how can wisdom help us uh, during a game and, and, and um, figuring out what to do? Um, well, if we, let's say, evaluate or assess the, the situation, we can see that black is currently down a lot of material. Um, white has an extra rook and, and two minor pieces for maybe a few pawns, which is quite a lot. Um, but on the other hand, white's king on h4 uh, is obviously in a lot of danger and, and looks really weak and it seems like black might be able to just whip up uh, a meaning attack uh, against the king. Uh, since it's black to move, black okay, has the initiative and, and should definitely look for some kind of uh, forced mate. Um, if you haven't figured out how to give mate to the king yet, I would really encourage you, now that you know that there's a mate in the position, to pause the video once again and, and try to um, figure it out. But okay, we'll move on. So. The way I feel like an experienced player would approach this uh, position is, is as follows. So very qu quickly we would recognize this situation. We're down a lot of material, but White's King is super weak. So we have a huge potential here to give mate. If you know you're looking for mate in the position, an experienced chess player knows that you should be mainly looking for forcing moves, um, but especially checks. Uh, if you don't give a check in the position, this is what gives white the chance to, to move, maybe get a piece back into the defense, or even unleash some kind of uh, counterattack, rook takes b7 check, you know, trying to maybe give back some material, but getting some play of their own. Um, all kinds of possibilities. So an experienced player already knows that they should mainly be focusing on the checks in the position. Um, but there are a lot of checks in the position to consider. The queen has uh, a number of checks. Let's say queen f2, queen f2 and queen f4 uh, check being the, the main possibilities. Um, and we also have one check with the pawn uh, g5. So which one of these moves do we calculate first? Once that we, we've seen, you know, we have like three reasonable checks, which one do we calculate first? Well, the experienced chess player understands that you're not going to be able to give mate uh, against an open king with just a queen. Uh, you need help, you need other pieces uh, involved. Um, the only other piece black has is the rook, which is very far away, so a move like rook d8 is going to take way too long. But there is a way to get the rook in with tempo, and that is, of course, the move uh, g5. Um, so in my opinion, I feel like uh, someone who hasn't seen the position before but is a really strong player um, could figure out the solution very, very quickly uh, just based on their, their wisdom, their experience, and, and their intuition alone. And, and I mean, finding this move... I think for a strong player is really a matter of seconds and, and maybe even less because we understand that number one we have to give mate the queen cannot do it uh, by itself and we need to involve other pieces uh, into the attack uh, if you recognize that in, in the matter of uh, you know half a second or one second then the the first move becomes immediately apparent okay so what does happen after g5 well after g5 uh, white is forced to take no other legal moves Black plays rook g8 check, getting uh, the rook into the game. Again, there are actually a lot of other checks in the position too. We can consider queen g2 check, f6 check, h6 check. But the experienced chess player understands, you know, if you're going to give mate, you should first start with including the rook uh, before you think, think about uh, using uh, the pawns. So rook g8 check uh, should definitely stick out. Uh, White's king only has uh, two options here, king h6 or king h4. Um, but both, as I'm sure you guys realize by now, are just leading to mate. 
king h6, queen h3 is a mate, and uh, king h4, uh, queen g4 is also a mate. Um, so, actually, it turns out the problem is just a relatively simple mate in three, but I'm sure for a lot of players it might take uh, several minutes, maybe even more, before they were uh, able to, to figure it out. For stronger players, uh, I imagine it was probably pretty quick, and I think this is some of that, uh, let's say, you can call it wisdom, you can call it tactical intuition, I think there are a lot of different ways to describe it, but but hopefully the, the concept is kind of um, making sense. The, the more experience you have, the more understanding you have about chess, the easier it is for you to decide what to calculate and uh, for how long and, and what to focus on. The last aspect I want to discuss is time management. So again, like I mentioned, uh, we're almost always playing chess with limited time on the clock, and so you simply just don't have time to calculate everything out super thoroughly. A lot of times you're going to have to either uh, take shortcuts or cut corners, um, cut your calculation short because you need to reserve some time for a later portion in the game. I think this is a really important aspect of chess and it's one that a lot of players uh, definitely struggle with. In fact, I imagine virtually all players fall on either either one side of the, uh, of the equation, either your um, spending too much time earlier on and you end up in, in time trouble and not enough time in the critical phase of the game where things are really complicated and you could really use a lot of extra time for your calculation. Um, or you fall on the other side where you have no problem with uh, playing quickly. In fact, sometimes you play too quickly in a position where you really should have been spending more time trying to uh, investigate deeper and, and delve into things and really try to figure out what's going on. Uh, I personally fall into the second category where I feel like I have a lot of situations where I might have played a little bit quicker than, than I should have and as a result I didn't fully anticipate something that could have happened, I didn't consider another option, uh, and uh, I ended up making a wrong move because I just didn't spend enough time in that, in that position. Um, so working on time management I think uh, is definitely a huge concern for some players if you're someone who falls into time trouble uh, a lot then this is clearly something to work on um, as well as um, if you're someone who tends to blunder a lot you know with lots of time on your clock making huge mistakes uh, it means that you need to work on your discipline a little bit and, and, and work on your ability to spend more time investigating and calculating in a position. Uh, okay, so you guys probably noticed that I put up a problem here. Uh, this is uh, white to play and win. Uh, if you'd like uh, some time to consider all the options, I would encourage you to uh, pause the video. But I think this is actually a good problem to illustrate um, some of the, the previous components that, that we've been uh, discussing in terms of, um, well, analytical skill, evaluation, visualization, and, uh, and wisdom. Um, so here it's uh, white to move, like I mentioned, white to play and win. And if we're just trying to first assess the position and figure out what's going on, it's pretty clear that white's king on f1 here is worse than, than black's king on f3. Meaning, uh, if nothing quick happens in the near future, black's king is going to be super active and will simply pick up the d4 pawn. Uh, and white will be losing. So with that in mind, I think the experienced player realizes that the only chance white has in this position uh, is going to be with the A pawn and, and trying to, to push it. Okay, so now it's time to figure out what to actually do. If we imagine this situation uh, was uh, in a real tournament game, then you know the way I would structure my thinking is as follows. Uh, absolutely the first move I would check here is the move A4, trying to see if I can just promote the pawn by force. Uh, then, of course, we would have to visualize, well, black's king is going to try to run back and stop the pawn, king e4. And if we continue the calculation, a5, king d5, a6, king c6, a7, king b7. Uh, well, once the black king reaches b7, it's going to be, be able to stop the pawn, and it seems like we're, we're not promoting. Uh, now, a faster way to do this calculation, as I'm sure many of you are, are likely aware of, is you can use the, the rule of the square. Meaning after the move a4, king e4, if you understand the rule of the square, then you already know, well, the king is inside the square, and because of that, it's going to be able to, to catch up with the pawn. Um, this is a pretty well-known shortcut when it comes to calculation. Uh, if you've never heard of this concept before, I'll uh, link a video in the description that you can check out uh, for a um, you know, more detailed explanation. Um, because I think it's okay, an extremely useful uh, calculation shortcut in the endgame that, that basically everyone should know. 
Um, so basically once you get to this position in your calculation, if you're familiar with the rule of the square, you can understand, okay, the king is going to be stopping the pawn. Um, but then that begs the question of, well, what else? I mean, a3 is not really going to cut it here. If the pawn is just going to be one tempo slower, then of course, black's king is going to be in time. Uh, so by this point, I'm sure many of you have already figured out the, the only other possible try, uh, and that is the move d5. So this is a, a really, really uh, nice move, a brilliant idea, winning the game for white. Now the pawn is advancing and threatening to push to d6 and, and so on, so black is basically obliged to take it. And now with black's pawn on d5, the situation has concretely changed. Uh, and after the move a4, now white can start pushing the pawn, king e4. Even though the king is, again, inside the square of the pawn, well, the concrete detail is that black's pawn is on d5 and in the way, meaning after white pushes a5, black's king is uh, not going to be able to stop the pawn, and uh, white's pawn is promoting and, and winning the game. Black can try the move d4, trying to uh, push their own pawn, um, and in terms of the pure pawn race, it seems like black is doing okay, but there are two issues here. Number one, white promotes with check. Another concrete detail that basically changes everything. Because we promote the check, we're going to win the game. Number two, we could also play the move king to e2, stopping black's pawn and pointing out the fact that black's king is still way too far to stop the pawn on a7. So two different ways to win the game um, based on, well, we can say style and, and preference. So going back to the start of the problem, uh, I think this is a pretty famous problem. I'm sure a lot of players have either seen the exact position before, or maybe something uh, very similar. Uh, I imagine it's it's probably uh, right out of uh, Divoretsky's Endgame Manual. Um, but the first time someone sees this position, a strong player, uh, I highly doubt that their first instinct is going to be the move uh, d5, if they're really just trying to figure out what to do in the in the position. Now, if you set this up as a problem and you say, you know, white to play and win, then okay, experienced player understands it's going to be something tricky, it's not going to be as simple as just a4, and they might just immediately consider this random move. But if you if we consider a situation in a game when we don't know that there's something to be found and, and players are just kind of approaching the position in a, in a direct way, you know, the first move we're going to be considering here is always going to be a4. And once you realize that that's not working, you look for other options, only then do you consider other ideas, uh, you think about d5, and... Um, I would say that this is a, a very, very good example of a, a technique and calculation that I want to include in a later video um, that I would refer to as uh, retroactive thinking. So once again, the move d5 would not be obvious to anyone. It just looks like white is losing a pawn. But once you realize what's the problem in the principled line, uh, where we just push a4, a5 immediately, um, once you realize, well, the king is in the square and the we need to do something else here, uh, then you consider different ideas as a way of trying to improve on this variation. I think it's a very, very important uh, calculation technique, one that a lot of experienced players uh, use uh, in different situations, and okay, one that hopefully uh, will make sense to, to the people watching this video. So that basically wraps up what I believe to be the, the five most critical components of calculation. Once again, you have your, your analytical skill, which includes your ability to find good moves, your pattern recognition, your, your speed of calculation. Um, but you also have things like your visualization, which is obviously uh, super critical, your evaluation, which without it, you know, you wouldn't be able to, to make good moves for, for very long. Um, your wisdom, which will help you determine which direction to look at uh, on a chessboard, what kind of moves to consider, uh, how to structure your thinking, and of course your time management. Being able to do all of the above while also keeping an eye on the clock and, and keeping uh, in control. With that, let's uh, finally go over uh, this problem. I'm sure uh, for some of you it might have been uh, very, very difficult. For others, maybe it was uh, pretty easy. And uh, let's try to figure out how can white win here. Well, the most obvious move in the position uh, is, of course, to move rook to g3, uh, creating this pin against the queen and the king. In fact, I'm sure a lot of players simply stopped here and said, well, rook g3 <laughs> wins the queen, you know, white is winning, what's the <laughs> what's the big deal? But of course, things are, are not so simple. Uh, here, after black plays queen takes g3, knight takes g3, and a takes b4, well, material is actually equal, minor piece and two pawns each, and uh, we can say that this situation is uh, very, very drawish. Um, such limited material, 
Um, neither side has any uh, huge weaknesses. In fact, black has a pretty strong bishop on the board, uh, and so by no means is, is white winning here. So rook g3, queen takes, knight takes uh, g3 is not quite working, but we do have another option in this position, and maybe some higher rated players uh, figured this one out, and that is the move knight takes h6 uh, check, um, hitting the, queen, the king and actually ignoring the queen on g3. Uh, now, I'm sure a lot of players might have considered this, but probably rejected it, because once we take on h6, well, the knight is never going to be able to take on g3, so it seems like black's queen is, is just going to be uh, alive. Uh, and if you stopped your calculation here and said, well, this is pointless, uh, you know, I definitely wouldn't blame you. Um, going back to the, the starting position, there were some other moves we could consider. Uh, the immediate knight takes h6 check. Uh, though this one simply does not lead to a forced win. After queen takes h6, uh, white has some checks, but nothing convincing. Black's king is overall going to be safe. Uh, and there was also the move rook to e8 check, which should definitely be considered. Um, but here, after king to f7, uh, white has some, some other checks, but again, nothing convincing and, and nothing that's actually um, winning uh, in the situation uh, for, uh, for white. Um, so... Going back, what to do? Well, rook g3 is the correct uh, first move, but the situation is, is pretty deep. Um, black really doesn't have anything other than queen takes g3. If black were to take the bishop on b4, well then white does not take on g5. Again, we have kind of an equal endgame, but instead we can take on h6 with check first, and then after the king moves anywhere, we'll be playing rook takes g5, and white will have an extra rook and winning position. Uh, okay, so black is basically forced to play queen takes rook. Like I mentioned, knight takes queen here uh, leads to a drawn endgame after a takes b4. But we do have a second option in the position, knight takes h6 check. Now here, black's choices are pretty limited. There's king h8 and king g7, but king g7 actually allows knight f5 check, forking the king and queen and just winning the game. White will be up a piece. So that's uh, winning for white. Black is left with king to h8. And uh, here it feels like there's actually uh, no immediate win. Bishop c3 check would be really nice, but the problem is queen is covering this square. Uh, so what to do? Okay, if you haven't solved the problem yet, I would like to give you this uh, as another chance to pause the video and try to find the, uh, the last uh, tactic in the problem that wins the game for white. Uh, it's a very nice one. If you haven't seen the idea before, I understand it's going to be tough. You simply haven't developed the pattern, but I think it's still healthy to, to try and figure it out. Uh, and then of course, you know, feel, feel amazed at the solution if, uh, if you don't get it. Um, okay, so white to play and win. What to do? Well, bishop c3 check is not working. Knight f7 check, black will then play king to g7, and the king will simply get out. Um, but white has this really, really amazing uh, move, bishop to d6. So what's the point behind this move? Well, number one, it's attacking the queen. If queen takes d6, it's not so hard to see that actually we'll have knight f7 check, forking the king and queen once again, and white will be up a piece in the endgame and completely winning. So um, a nice decoy type of tactic, trying to lure the queen uh, to the square. But actually, things are worse for black than, than they seem, because the bishop is also potentially threatening to still get onto this diagonal and uh, checkmate black's king. Meaning, if the queen uh, walks away somewhere, like, like queen h4, for example, then white will play bishop e5 check, and black has only one move to uh, delay the mate, but white will be winning the game. Um, so after bishop d6, uh, black again has very limited options. They have a few ways actually of controlling the diagonal, queen c3, queen g7, even queen g5. Um, but all of these moves lead to uh, the same uh, win uh, for white, both queen, uh, queen c3, queen g7, queen g5. They all run into this very nice move, bishop to e5 check. Uh, a final decoy uh, forcing the queen to e5, and then after knight f7 check and knight takes e5, the knight will easily stop the a-pawn, and white's extra piece uh, will be decisive here. So we have the same uh, idea against the other moves, like I mentioned, queen g5, bishop e5 check is winning, and queen g7, once again, we have bishop e5, and uh, black will be losing the queen and uh, losing the game. Um, so uh, I think it's a really nice problem, obviously it's a pretty difficult one, but uh, since 
someone was going to be looking at it for a few minutes, I fear we might as well do a really nice and, and challenging problem. Uh, and I think it actually highlights a lot of uh, very nice aspects of, of calculation. Um, the first one I would highlight is after the moves rook g3, queen takes g3. Of course, many players here automatically assume knight takes g3 uh, should be the move. And in most cases, knight takes queen would be the best move. Um, but that's what makes this problem special is that white is avoiding this super, super obvious move, not taking the queen, but instead uh, taking the bishop. Uh, so being able to avoid these kinds of assumptions, like the knight has to take the queen, there are no other options for white in the position. Being able to avoid this assumption is, is something that uh, uh, is a skill that uh, I think is actually very, very critical to, to being able to, to calculate effectively and, and find uh, unusual ideas uh, in the position. Um, and then, of course, the, the finish I, I, I thought is, is really nice. Um, when it seems like white's bishop and knight are both scattered, black's queen is on an open board, it, amazingly white has this resource bishop d6 where the pieces just coordinate beautifully. Uh, black's queen has no good checks, the king is perfectly safe, um, and uh, it turns out that the bishop and knight are simply overpowering the queen, so of course uh, just a really, really... Um, a beautiful idea and definitely a pattern that is worth uh, storing and, and remembering uh, for for as long as you can. Uh, Alright guys, so with this I'm going to be wrapping up this first video. Like I mentioned so many times, I'll be making more videos going into um, each of the different aspects of calculation a little bit deeper as to how specifically you should work on improving those um, and uh, what can you can do to overall better your game. Um, if you had any specific questions on anything I, I mentioned uh, or any, any topics or terms you didn't understand, please do leave a comment below. It's not a very big channel, so I will respond to you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, again, if you have any questions, feel free to, to comment below. And um, well, I'll catch you guys in, uh, in the next video. Take care.